nearly half a century, one aircraft alone has dominated the skies. During those years, it has dropped more conventional bombs than any other airplane. With a maximum speed of 650 miles per hour, a range of over 8,000 miles, and capable of dropping 70,000 pounds of bombs, it is the most lethal bomber in the world. It can also deliver nuclear bombs, missiles, and precision-guided weapons. When a United States president wants to wield his big stick, he sends in the B-52s. When the United States wants to punish an enemy, we send the heavy bombers, and one of those is the B-52. The B-52 has now become a symbol of more than a bomber. It's a symbol of America's resolve. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the world of the B-52 Strata Fortress. As far back as World War I, the use of aircraft as a means of delivering explosives was accepted as an effective way to strike at the enemy. As aircraft became bigger, so too did the amount of bombs they could drop. With the outbreak of World War II, Adolf Hitler unleashed his bombers, smashing enemy territory in advance of his armies. But as the tide of war changed, it was the Allies who used the bomber to its full destructive potential. With raids of a thousand bomber aircraft at a time, Allied heavy bombers such as the British Lancaster and the American B-17 proved their superiority by pounding Nazi Germany into submission. Japan, too, was systematically destroyed by vast armadas of American B-29s. In early August 1945, two bombs were dropped that changed the face of war forever. And with it, the birth of one of the most terrifying instruments of war, the nuclear weapon. For the first time in over six years, the world was at peace, but signs of another conflict were already on the horizon, the growing threat of war with the Soviet Union. The USA began to prepare for hostilities with the Eastern Bloc. On March the 21st, 1946, an organization known as SAC, Strategic Air Command, was established. There was no office building, so we used offices in the old Martin bomber plant on this airfield. And uh, we start seeing people that we had fought the war with coming from all over the place, mostly all B-29 types. SAC wanted air combat units capable of flying huge distances and employing the latest and most advanced weapons. But what America did not have was an aircraft powerful enough to meet these intense requirements. With this in mind, the Boeing company began working on various designs for a long-range bomber. These included radical swept-back wings and jet and conventional propeller-powered aircraft. But it wasn't until October the 21st, 1948, that Colonel Henry Pete Warden of the Wright Air Development Center met with Boeing engineers. They arrived with a wealth of documents and designs, but Warden paid little attention to the paperwork and requested a prototype using turbojet engines. He wanted the plans for this new prototype and he wanted them fast. Pete Warden gave them just two days. It was a daunting request, but the team were not going to let Warden down. We were the ones that had to do it, and we knew what we had to do. And you see, I had, I had all my aeronautical data on the B-55 because I'd just made a report uh, on, on the uh, airplane to Pete Warden earlier that week. So we had all the data, but we had to, we had to move it into the size of the B-52. The genesis of the mighty B-52 came about in humble surroundings in a room of the Van Cleve Hotel in downtown Dayton, Ohio. It was a classic small town hotel. I think the Boeing Company had a suite on the seventh floor. It consisted of a kind of a, of a, of a sitting room. It had a, 
uh, a big round table and a couch. So that that was that was a suite. It was it was pretty good for the Van Cleve. The first thing we did on Saturday morning is we we kind of figured out what we needed to do. We needed some drawings. We needed a performance document. So uh, Bond and I, we were the the air, air, airplane uh, technical people. So we. We started in on the on the performance, taking my B-55 data and transferring it into the bigger airplane. And uh, Ed Wells and George Shire disappeared. And at the time, we, d we didn't miss them until they were gone. Uh, they came back about two hours later with some balsa. And what they'd been out doing, they decided they wanted a model. And they had to go around to the model shops and find the biggest piece of balsa in Dayton. Uh, and that set the scale of the model. Uh, Shire was the best aerodynamicist in the world and Vaughn and I were a little upset with him because we, here we had this massive document to put together and here he was sitting in the corner whittling a, a model. But anyway, that's what he did. Over the following 24 hours, the aircraft began to take shape. It would be an eight-engine jet using podded pairs of the Pratt and Whitney engines. It would have a top speed of 490 knots and the potential to deliver a 10,000 pound bomb load over a range of 5,320 miles. It would also have a radically redesigned wing with a span of 185 feet. By Sunday noon, we had things pretty, pretty good shape, so we called in the secretary of the Boeing office there, Ms. Hines, and she typed up all the material that we'd written. It, 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 the document has a few uh, pages in it. On the Monday morning, they presented their work to Colonel Warden. He was impressed with the jet-powered plans and asked the Boeing engineers to continue with the design. Endorsement of the aircraft didn't happen for another three months, but in January 1949, production started in Seattle. Over the following two years, Boeing worked and tested their new plane at a feverish pitch. Nowadays they have what they call computational aerodynamics and they can do it with a computer. But in those days the wind tunnel was, was, the, was the way we did it. And that's why it took about a year of wind tunnel testing. That was mostly in figuring out how to put the engines on the wing. And the data turned out to be okay. On April the 15th, 1951, the B-52 was wheeled out. Called the YB-52, it was prepared for its maiden flight at the Boeing field. We knew we had a winner before we flew it. The first flight you know, on the airplane, I, I was really excited about that. It had taken seven years from the initial United States Air Force request for a new bomber to get the B-52 on the runway. It didn't look like any other airplane, but I'd been deeply involved in the, in the testing in the wind tunnel, and I knew it should fly, but when it finally took off, the flaps hanging down, the swept wing, and I was real happy to see it disappear over the horizon. Engines look normal. The test flight uh, entailed checking out the airplane and checking out the systems. Now, like for instance, uh, the control forces turned out to be many times greater than what they should have been. And so it took both of us to turn the airplane under certain, certain conditions. The flight lasted two hours, 51 minutes, and ended with a perfect landing at Moses Lake. Just like an airplane now. It was universally agreed that Boeing was onto a winner. Over the next three years, Boeing and the United States Air Force tested, developed, and refined the aircraft. Many improvements were made. One of the most noticeable was by the head of Strategic Air Command, General Curtis E. LeMay, that they changed the crew seating configuration. Now the first airplane did not have the right cockpit on it. Uh, uh, General LeMay decided he wanted a side-by-side -side cockpit. 
and uh, we didn't have the time to hit the first airplane. So the first uh, three or four airplanes that came off the line were B-52Ys, I think, and they had the tandem cockpit. Finally, in 1955, the new B-52 was revealed to the public and ready for active service. But the Soviet Union had by now developed its own atomic and hydrogen bombs, and America desperately needed a heavy bomber to strike back if necessary. Would the B-52 fit the role so urgently needed by Strategic Air Command? During the mid-1950s, the Soviet bloc began to build a terrifying arsenal of nuclear weapons. America was determined to provide a deterrent to prevent the Soviet Union from ever using their bombs. This era of the Cold War now needed a strategy. We initiated and developed and planned and wrote the first nuclear war plan. It was a SAC war plan, but it became a national war plan. It was into this uncertain and highly charged environment that the B-52 came into service with the Strategic Air Command. Early B-52s had a six-man crew on the upper flight deck with a pilot, co-pilot and electronic warfare officer. On the lower deck with a radar navigator bombardier and navigator. In the rear of the aircraft was the tail gunner. Crammed throughout the wings and fuselage were the fuel tanks. And along the lower fuselage were the massive bomb bays. For some of these elite crews that SAC had selected, it was the first time they'd ever seen a B-52. When I walked around a B-52, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And then I look at the skin on this B-52, and it's all wrinkled, kind of like mine. And I thought, this, is, this thing can't fly. This is not going to be good. You cannot be serious. You cannot be serious. So I was not a happy camper, eh? I was just absolutely awestruck uh, by the sound, the noise, uh, the motion of the airplane. Uh, but it did fly and it flew very well. It took a lot of strength, very fatiguing. Imagine yourself told to drive a big 18-wheeler Mack truck down the highway. Not only down the highway, but into the neighborhood and around the corner and back it up. And that's what a B-52 feels like in comparison, say, to an F-4 fighter which is like driving a Lamborghini. You put the uh, throttle forward on all eight engines, the entire airplane shakes, you have this noise, and it's sitting there on the end of the runway. Everything's vibrating. You know, it's almost like a sprinter ready to take off. And then you get moving, and it slowly starts accelerating. And then it gets a little faster, a little faster, a little faster, and then you have about a 12,000 foot runway. And you finally take off, and you lumber up, nose down, you climb until you, you know, reach your altitude and go on. But the first time, it's really an exhilarating experience. The B-52 wasn't necessarily difficult to, to land and take off the airplane, except in a crosswind crab system where you could dial in the crosswind crab so that you could land the aircraft while it was pointed relatively into the wind but you were flying actually sideways, so it was a very unusual and spooky sequence. As U.S. military thinking developed during the Cold War, the greatest fear was of a sudden preemptive Soviet strike. So SAC ensured that 12 B-52s, fully armed with nuclear weapons, were airborne 24 hours per day, 365 days per year. The plan was known as Chrome Dome. It, uh was the plan in the Cold War to arm the bomber fleet with nuclear weapons and achieve a high state of readiness and uh, comply with our national policy, which was to encircle the Soviet Union. Operation Chrome Dome had B-52s flying three basic routes. A northern route across North America and Canada past Newfoundland and Iceland, up past Greenland and the Arctic Circle, 
across Alaska, and back down the western side of the U.S. A southern route across the Atlantic, orbiting the Mediterranean, then back to the U.S. And one B-52 constantly on patrol over Greenland, 24 hours a day. Each patrol was designed continuously to monitor critical targets in the Soviet Union that would never be more than two hours flying time from a patrolling B-52. But these missions, some as long as 26 hours, took incredible stamina on the part of the crews. Sitting in an injection seat, you had a 40-pound parachute on your back. Uh, you were wearing a helmet, fairly heavy and thermal underwear, you may have uh, heavy boots, uh, you have winter flight suit or summer flight suit. It was normally dark down there because you needed to have uh, good visibility when you're watching the radar scope. Most of the times it was cold, a negative 55 degrees. And of course the skin of the airplane some places wasn't that well uh, insulated. And then you add on top of that your high altitude, your low ambient humidity, and you would lose a lot of moisture. There were many times that I would lose five to ten pounds, usually just in water, from you know a long stressful mission. It was very cramped. Uh, we had air mattresses. Uh, you could lie down and rest. Uh, obviously, the one pilot would be flying the airplane. Uh, one navigator navigating. We uh, early on had a, a small oven where we could uh, cook uh, what was uh, I characterize as an early TV dinner. Uh, we had a hot cup where you could have coffee or heat up some soup. Uh, oh, and we had box lunches as well. All over the range of over 8,000 miles, the Cold War B-52s had to refuel twice on each mission. But with these massive aircraft, each refueling was a maneuver fraught with danger. You are in very close proximity to the airplane. And you imagine driving down the highway, you like to have two seconds between cars. Well, we're talking maybe 20 feet between the airplane that's above you and the bomber right below. You know, and it, about a fraction of a second, if you hit an air bump or some kind of clear air turbulence, you have the capability, you know, of his tail coming down and your nose going up, and uh, yes, it, it, it could ruin your whole day. The boom operator in the tanker, who's, if he flies the boom, you had to fly the B-52 into this envelope, into this narrow airspace under the tanker that the boom operator liked, and some boom operators were so damn picky that if you didn't have it within a foot where they wanted you, they wouldn't stick the boom in. You know, and I'd say, put the damn thing in, you jerk. Any time of the day or night when you were the pilot and were air refueling, taking on at least 40,000 pounds of fuel, when I finished, my body would be wet, just absolutely soaked. Perspiration. From October the 1st, 1957, during normal periods of readiness, 40% of SAC's bomber force was on continuous ground alert. Ready to get airborne at 15 minutes notice. When that klaxon went off, of course you never knew for sure whether it was a training exercise or whether it was a real thing. fumbles over to the wall, finds the light switch, turns it on, jump into your flight suit, get that on, get your boot on, grab your parka or whatever else you need, depending on where in the world you are, and then you run like mad out to the airplane. And then the heart starts beating and the adrenaline starts, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. And the next message may be the, you know, call to go to war. Despite the hardships and training, the reason why the crew's alertness was so vital was that every B-52 was armed with up to four thermonuclear weapons. Each warhead was more than 1,700 times more powerful than those dropped on Japan. And if they were needed, then only the President could order them in.
In the early 1960s, Strategic Air Command was the key deterrent against any attack by Russia. The spearhead of this force were the mighty B-52s. There was a story that used to be told. that There was a journal, and he'd go to the uh, Russian premier, and, he, and the question was, uh, is today the day we can take on the United States and we can come out ahead? The general would say, not today, sir. And our job was to make sure that every day that was his answer. To enable the U.S. to keep that high state of alert, Strategic Air Command required the B-52 crews to undertake the long, stress-inducing tours of duty. The average tour of duty uh, for SAC combat crew members uh, in the early 60s, you would normally pull two seven-day alert tours per month. So that's 14 days out of roughly 30 or 31 days that you could expect to be sitting nuclear ground alert. And you were expected to be able to launch within 15 minutes and go strike those targets if given the order to do so. So in addition to the pulling of the ground alert, you could expect to fly maybe three, maybe four training missions per month. So your, your time was totally consumed uh, with those responsibilities. The continuous training of the crews was hard and rigorous. Only the best survived. But it was not enough to be the best. They had to pass the psychological tests as well. You had the psychological profile, which was very important. In other words, you're talking about taking a nuclear weapon and dropping it on a country, and a lot of people can't handle that. And physiologically, are you able to take the long missions, the 20-plus the hour missions that are required? Do you have the stamina? And you're given physical uh, tests to see if you had that stamina. The training required everyone to do their job, not just the crew, but the maintenance people, and all the support people, even the people that made the lunches. Everyone had to do their job to keep the fleet in the air when it was needed. The driving force behind this quest for a state of excellence was General Curtis E. LeMay. He was the, the big daddy. He was the one that, uh, that started SAC. Uh, yeah, the, and of course the impression that he conveyed was that uh, there's nobody tougher than Curtis E. LeMay. First of all, a brilliant person to, to have in the concept he had, and he knew what his mission was. There, there were moments that he was uh, a loving father. He, was, uh, he had times that he, 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 he could show compassion, but on the outside he was just a rough, gruff son of a bitch, I guess. But should an attack be launched against America, a series of defensive steps were put into action. Incoming missiles or bombers would be picked up by the early warning radar tracking stations. Once verified, the alert that the U.S. was under attack was passed on to Strategic Air Command HQ in Omaha, Nebraska. They would put the entire B-52 fleet on alert and scramble the plane. SAC would then consult with the White House. The president was never more than a few feet from the war plan. If, and only if it was necessary, the president would give the final order to go. Then the B-52s that were already airborne would receive their coded instructions, known as the go codes, to fly to their targets. There was a coded message that you would receive and it required you and another what they called positive control crew member to authenticate this message and it was in the there was a code the code was a letter code if you and the other positive control which was the radar navigator the bombardier if you will and if both of your cards matched the message then that meant it was an authentic message and it would authorize you to strike your target most b-52 crews had already made arrangements with their families for when and if they were ordered to bomb their targets I had taken the opportunity, as had many other SAC combat crew members, to instruct uh, my wife as to what she needed to do uh, given a nuclear attack on the United States. And that included uh, putting together the items and materials that she would need to take care of the children, packing the automobile, uh, and have it ready to go to leave uh, the immediate target 
uh, you know, our SAC bases were all targeted and get away from it. Every mission carried with it an awesome responsibility. Roger, it looks like it's a kind of a terrifying thought. You see, I had seen an A-bomb go off in Bikini. Not many had seen one. And I knew how horrifying it was. And we were carrying things much, much more powerful. And of course, all of us were keenly aware uh, of the significance of the Cold War and the threat that was posed by the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact nations. And we were committed, uh, if, if need be, to take them out. We also knew that we were never committed to uh, a first strike or a preemptive strike. I felt confident that every crew that I was on would fly the assigned mission. You know, we'd go there and do the best we could. If we were able to strike our targets, if not, if we were blown out of the sky, we were blown out of the sky. Because, uh, you know, if that happened, it meant that our country had already been struck. Each B-52 bomber was then on its own, heading towards its target. They can't pull you back. Once you have that, you're committed to the target. You just orbit there, waiting until one of two things happens. Either you get that message that tells you to proceed on to your target, or if you don't get it, you have to determine how long you can stay there in orbit at that point before you have to head back so you can make it back to a base and land without running out of fuel. Should the enemy bombers or missiles get through and destroy SAC headquarters, there was an alternative plan to guide the mid-air B-52s to their targets. It was called looking glass. We also had uh, the looking glass, the SAC Airborne Command Post, which flew continuously uh, from February 1961 until 1991 uh, with a uh, SAC general officer on board with a full battle staff. Uh, those were eight and a half hour missions. They flew uh, three missions a day. And of course that system was designed if Strategic Air Command headquarters was lost due to an attack, then that general officer would find himself uh, running the war and talking to uh, the Commander in Chief, the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense. I was privileged to fly 358 of those missions in the 10 years I was a SAC general officer. This flying command center was a vital linchpin in the doomsday scenario. But thankfully, it was never needed, as just one misguided bomb would have resulted in a nuclear catastrophe, with potentially not a single living thing left alive on the planet. But accidents with all these nuclear armed bombers did happen. And when a B-52 with four 50 megaton bombs crashed, the world held its breath. On January the 17th, 1966, a B-52 on regular Mediterranean patrol was refueling at 30,500 feet over the coast of Spain. We had a mid-air collision uh, over Spain between a B-52 uh, and a uh, KC-135 uh, jet tanker. The KC-135 crew was lost. Uh, so many of the uh, B-52 crew survived. The weapons uh, were, were deployed, if you will, and uh, had to be recovered from the sea, and it uh, created uh, uh, quite a sensation. We were successful in recovering those weapons, and the safety that was built into the weapons, uh, there was never any a concern about a nuclear detonation. After another incident in Greenland, neutral governments began to object that B-52s armed with nuclear weapons were flying over their territory. The risk of a catastrophe was too great. And the introduction of intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and nuclear submarines had given the United States an alternative retaliatory arsenal. Those events uh, created such a stir uh, on the world scene that Strategic Air Command and the civilian leadership of the United States decided to, to stop them, to curtail that operation. In September 1968, the Air Alert System of Chrome Dome was decommissioned. 
for the men who had flown those missions. The B-52 had fulfilled its role as a world peacekeeper. Looking back on it, I, I, I don't regret the 17 years I spent in SAC. I think they, we, we did a lot for our country. I think we, one of the things we're talking about is that uh, most people think the, the Cold War just ended. It doesn't. We say that we won, SAC won the Cold War. For over 10 years, the B-52 had patrolled the skies, waiting for the go codes that fortunately never came. But its days as a bomber were not over. It was about to take on a new mission over Southeast Asia. When Southeast Asia came about and there was a need to deliver large firepower, that is conventional ordnance, iron bombs as we refer to them, the Air Force looked around and the best delivery platform they had was in fact the B-52. In March 1965, in the escalating conflict in Vietnam, President Johnson gives the go-ahead for Operation Rolling Thunder, the bombing of North Vietnam. Again, the B-52 is mobilized, and again it is modified to conduct its mission. We modified the B-52D models with what we call the Big Belly modification to the point where between external and internal carriage, they could carry 108 750-pound bombs. From 1965 onwards, the B-52D Big Belly versions would carry the burden of the conflict single-handedly until joined by the B-52G versions in the final stages of conflict. Between 1965 and 1968, in Rolling Thunder, B-52s flew more than 2,000 sorties and dropped over 630,000 tons of bombs. This was the first time that the B-52 had entered the theater of actual warfare. I had already told my crew, if we get hit, mm. We're going to ride that airplane until it blows up. I didn't think they'd be taking any prisoners. When you were flying over there, uh, it was a large, non-stealthy airplane. When you would put a radar scope on it, it would stand out almost like a flashlight because of the, the sides, you know, it was metal sides and it would reflect radar energy. That's why there were so many ECM, electronic countermeasure aircraft flying with the missions and the electronic countermeasure officer on board. But still, even with that, it was pretty much a sitting duck at high altitude. Apart from SAMs, surface-to-air missiles, the B-52s had to face the Russian-built MiG-21 fighters. We didn't really have a problem with MiGs trying to attack the B-52s. We found the MiGs flying in formation with us and they were flying at our altitude, at our speed, at our heading, and they were transmitting this information down to the, to the gunnery, to the SAM sites. So here's a guy on the ground, he knows your heading, your altitude, and your airspeed, and that simplifies his, gunner, his process of shooting you down. By 1970, the heavy bombing also extended outside Vietnam to Cambodia and Laos. Sortie rates had risen to over 3,000 a month. But the best known manifestation of the massive U.S. air effort in Vietnam was still to come. It would bring losses of aircraft and crews to the B-52s, the like of which they never before had to face. By 1972, the conflict in Vietnam was raging and peace negotiations had reached a stalemate. So a major escalation of the B-52 bombing was ordered. Operation Linebacker 2. This was to be the systematic bombing of key objectives in North Vietnam. So December 15th, we got the alerting order of uh, Linebacker 2, and for security, we, nobody was allowed to go off base or make off base phone calls. And so we were told to prepare for a three-day maximum effort mission with the possibility of extended indefinitely. And at that time, we were told the targets would be Hanoi. Normally, when you briefed, you had a cell, three B-52s, 18 people, 
And usually they were talking to each other and the briefer's trying to brief and nobody pays any attention to him because it's the same briefing every day. And we go in this room, the room's packed with crew members. And this briefer could have spoken without a microphone in a whisper and everybody in the room would have heard every word he said. It was so quiet in that place. The thing I remember is looking around and I thought, you know, some of us probably aren't going to be alive. Some of us are going to be dead in four or five hours. We're not coming back. Three days into the operation, on the evening of December the 20th, John Newell's B-52 was making its bombing run over Hanoi when it came under attack by SAM missiles. To see these lights, these little spots of light, and then as they came up through the undercast, you could see the rocket plume of the engine of the surface-to-air missiles. And there were a lot of surface-to-air missiles coming up. I have a lot. Check left, check left. I got it. E-Dub, are you targeting anything? We've got something off the nose. Just about five seconds before uh, bombs away, and I looked out, and there's this, I could just see this huge sand right, right off the nose of the airplane, and I thought, Get above us before you detonate. Check left, check left, check left. I got it, I got it, I got it. Where we got a Sam tracking above the nose. It looks like it's going to detonate above us. Okay, it looks like it blew in part of your windscreen there. The next thing I knew, the airplane was in a 30 degree bank. All the windscreens were completely shattered, but intact. And half the red lights in the cockpit were on. So I thought, well, I'm going to try to level the wings, but probably won't be able to. Out on the left wing I see fire. I look out there and my number three and four engines are on fire. And just as I'm looking at that fire light, the second SAM hits the airplane. Another one coming up off the nose. Obviously put a pretty big hole in the crew compartment because we had explosive decompression. We lost our pressurization. And the noise was deafening. It was just like you were standing next to a train that was going by on track at 80 miles an hour. Just deafening noise. Now I look out and the engines aren't just on fire, now the wings on fire. I'm trying to decide, do we stay with the airplane until that wing stands? So I thought, I better get the crew out. And the way I did that is there's an emergency bailout light in each in front of each crew member and you have a guarded switch which a pilot can activate and when you hit that switch it turns that red light on in front of each crew member and that means eject. It's a kick in the butt when that thing fires and I thought this is not a good day. John Yule was captured by the North Vietnamese and taken to the infamous Hanoi prison camp nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton. After three days of solitary confinement Yule was on the receiving end of a B-52 bombing raid. And I can remember being huddled back in the corner of that cell with my fingers and my ears as deep as I could get them and I just knew my eardrums were going to rupture. And the plasters falling down from the ceiling in the cell and there are wooden shutters over the bars on the door and they're like they're made out of cardboard. They're flapping back and forth from the concussion from these bombs. And I'm sitting there thinking, three nights ago, I was up there dropping those bombs. The way I'm going to check out is being bombed by my buddies who I was up there bombing with three nights ago. Isn't that ironic? December the 20th was the most intense night of Operation Linebacker. Six B-52s were destroyed and 17 airmen lost their lives. After 93 days of captivity, John Newell was finally released. But for him, his savior was the B-52. That B-52 was such a sturdy airplane, such a tough bird, that it took two direct SAM hits, and I was in it for at least 50 or 60 seconds trying to decide whether to bail out or stay with it, and all my crew got out. Everybody survived. During Linebacker 2, the B-52s flew over 700 sorties in North Vietnam. They kept up the most sustained heavy bombing of the war, dropping over 15,000 tons of ordnance. They destroyed 1,600 military installations, 10 airfields, 500 railway tracks, 3 million gallons of petroleum, and 80% of all electrical power. But for the SAC crews, a high price was paid to complete that objective. Over the 11 days of the operation, 15 B-52s were shot down by SAM missiles. Of the 92 crew aboard these planes, 
61 went down over North Vietnam. Roughly half were killed and half were taken prisoner. Hanoi could not take a further battering and a ceasefire was signed. In March 1973, the last American troops left Vietnam. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, the B-52 remained the principal strategic heavy bomber in the U.S. air fleet. Constantly updated to incorporate the latest airborne technology, the B-52 was always ready to go into action. On September the 11th, 2001, as it neared its 50th birthday, the B-52 was called on again. On the 11th of September, we were in the middle of an exercise and we watched the airplane hit the second tower at which point we knew then that this was not just an accident that it was an attack on the United States so it really hit home at that point that we needed to take the attack back to the enemy their targets were the Taliban extremists who for five years had held the Afghanistan people in an Islamic reign of terror home to the Al-Qaeda terrorists this organization was held responsible for the September 11th atrocities. So began the war on international terrorism. The B-52 has at least three different precision weapons. Those bombs can drop within 40 feet or 13 meters, but we have seen in actual combat that we're actually beating that by a long margin. On the 10th of November this past year, we had an Air Force Staff Sergeant on horseback in Afghanistan who was under attack. He made a mayday call. Much to his luck that day, a B-52 orbiting close by was able to direct himself in that direction. And with, within eight minutes of being contacted, we laid down 16 of these wind-corrected munitions dispensers, killing about 250 to 300 of the advancing troops, allowing him and his Northern Alliance teammates to escape to fight another day. The mere sight of a B-52 overhead sending a signal to those on the ground that we're here to stay, we're watching, and we're not going to abandon you. For nearly half a century, the extraordinary B-52 has been at the forefront of U.S. policy in the air. The remarkable range of the aircraft means that from bases in the U.S., it can strike at targets anywhere in the world. What a bargain we got as taxpayers. And I don't know of very many airplanes that have been around, uh, still flying since uh, 1952. Current projections are that the B-52 has a combat life until 2045, almost 100 years of active service. No other bomber in history comes close to this record. I believe it will probably be, be the most famous airplane ever, and certainly one with perhaps the longest uh, longevity uh, of any combat airplane that we've ever had in the inventory. Started in the 40s, so 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, and now the 2000s. So the original designers, give them an attaboy for me because they did a very good job. And we've the last of today's special Spring Bank Holiday Battle Stations programs right after the break as we meet some of the men who fought in the M1 Abrams Super Tank, considered the most sophisticated tank ever built. a century, one aircraft alone has dominated the skies. During those years, it has dropped more conventional bombs than any other airplane. With a maximum speed of 650 miles per hour, a range of over 8,000 miles, and capable of dropping 70,000 pounds of bombs, it is the most lethal bomber in the world. It can also deliver nuclear bombs, missiles, and precision-guided weapons. When a United States president wants to wield his big stick, 
He sends in the B-52s. When the United States wants to punish an enemy, we send the heavy bombers, and one of those is the B-52. The B-52 has now become a symbol of more than a bomber. It's a symbol of America's resolve. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the world of the B-52 Strata Fortress. As far back as World War I, the use of aircraft as a means of delivering explosives was accepted as an effective way to strike at the enemy. As aircraft became bigger, so too did the amount of bombs they could drop. With the outbreak of World War II, Adolf Hitler unleashed his bombers, smashing enemy territory in advance of his armies. But as the tide of war changed, it was the Allies who used the bomber to its full destructive potential. With raids of a thousand bomber aircraft at a time, Allied heavy bombers such as the British Lancaster and the American B-17 proved their superiority by pounding Nazi Germany into submission. Japan, too, was systematically destroyed by vast armadas of American B-29s. In early August 1945, two bombs were dropped that changed the face of war forever. And with it, the birth of one of the most terrifying instruments of war, the nuclear weapon. For the first time in over six years, the world was at peace. But signs of another conflict were already on the horizon, the growing threat of war with the Soviet Union. The USA began to prepare for hostilities with the Eastern Bloc. On March the 21st, 1946, an organization known as SAC, Strategic Air Command, was established. There was no office building, so we used offices in the old Martin bomber plant on this airfield. And uh, we start seeing people that we had fought the war with coming from all over the place, mostly all B-29 types. SAC wanted air combat units capable of flying huge distances and employing the latest and most advanced weapons. But what America did not have was an aircraft powerful enough to meet these intense requirements. With this in mind, the Boeing company began working on various designs for a long-range bomber. These included radical swept-back wings and jet and conventional propeller-powered aircraft. But it wasn't until October the 21st, 1948, that Colonel Henry Pete Warden of the Wright Air Development Center met with Boeing engineers. They arrived with a wealth of documents and designs, but Warden paid little attention to the paperwork and requested a prototype using turbojet engines. He wanted the plans for this new prototype and he wanted them fast. Pete Warden gave them just two days. It was a daunting request, but the team were not going to let Warden down. We were the ones that had to do it, and we knew what we had to do. And you see, I had, I had all my aeronautical data on the B-55 because I'd just made a report uh, on, on the uh, airplane to Pete Warden earlier that week. So we had all the data, but we had to, we had to move it into the size of the B-52. The genesis of the mighty B-52 came about in humble surroundings, in a room of the Van Cleve Hotel in downtown Dayton, Ohio. It was a classic small-town hotel. I think the Boeing Company had a suite on the seventh floor. It consisted of a kind of a, of a, of a sitting room. It had a, a big round table and a couch. So that, that, was, that was the suite. It was, it was pretty good for the Van Cleve. The first thing we did on Saturday morning is we, we kind of figured out what we needed to do. We needed some drawings, we needed a performance document, so uh, Vaughn and I, we were the, the air, air, airplane uh, technical people, so we, we started in on the, on the performance, taking my B-55 data and transferring it into the bigger airplane, and uh, Ed Wells and George Shire disappeared. And at the time, we didn't 
miss them until they were gone. Now, they came back about two hours later with some balsa, and what they'd been out doing, they decided they wanted a model, and they had to go around to the model shops and find the biggest piece of balsa in Dayton, and that set the scale of the model. Uh, Shire was the best aerodynamicist in the world, and Vaughn and I were a little upset with him because here we had this massive document to put together, and here he was sitting in the corner whittling a, a model. But anyway, that's what he did. Over the following 24 hours, the aircraft began to take shape. It would be an eight-engine jet using podded pairs of the Pratt and Whitney engines. It would have a top speed of 490 knots and the potential to deliver a 10,000-pound bomb load over a range of 5,320 miles. It would also have a radically redesigned wing with a span of 185 feet. By Sunday noon, we had things pretty, pretty good shape, so we called in the secretary of the Boeing officer, Miss Hines, and she typed up all the material that we'd written. The, the, the document has a few uh, pages in it. On the Monday morning, they presented their work to Colonel Warden. He was impressed with the jet-powered plans and asked the Boeing engineers to continue with the design. Endorsement of the aircraft didn't happen for another three months, but in January 1949, production started in Seattle. Over the following two years, Boeing worked and tested their new plane at a feverish pitch. Nowadays, they have what they call computational aerodynamics, and they can do it with a computer. But in those days, the wind tunnel was, was, was the way we did it. And that's why it took about a year of wind tunnel testing. That was mostly in figuring out how to put the engines on the wing. And the data turned out to be okay. On April the 15th, 1951, the B-52 was wheeled out. Called the YB-52, it was prepared for its maiden flight at the Boeing field. We knew we had a winner before we flew it. The first flight you know, on the airplane, I, I was really excited about that. It had taken seven years from the initial United States Air Force request for a new bomber to get the B-52 on the runway. It didn't look like any other airplane, but I'd been deeply involved in the, in the testing in the wind tunnel, and I knew it should fly, but when it finally took off, the flaps hanging down, the swept wing, and I was real happy to see it disappear over the horizon. They just look normal. The test flight uh, entailed checking out the airplane and checking out the systems. Now, like, for instance, uh, the control forces turned out to be many times greater than what they should have been. And so it took both of us to turn the airplane under certain, certain conditions. The flight lasted two hours, 51 minutes, and ended with a perfect landing at Moses Lake. Just like a airplane now. It was universally agreed that Boeing was onto a winner. Over the next three years, Boeing and the United States Air Force tested, developed, and refined the aircraft. Many improvements were made. One of the most noticeable was by the head of Strategic Air Command, General Curtis E. LeMay, that they changed the crew seating configuration. Now, the first airplane did not have the right cockpit on it. Uh, uh, General LeMay decided he wanted a side-by-side -side cockpit. And uh, we didn't have the time to hit the first airplane. So the first uh, three or four airplanes that came off the line were B-52Ys, I think, and they had the tandem cockpit. Finally, in 1955, the new B-52 was revealed to the public and ready for active service. But the Soviet Union had by now developed its own atomic and hydrogen bombs, and America desperately needed a heavy bomber to strike back if necessary. Would the B-52 fit the role so urgently needed 
by Strategic Air Command. During the mid-1950s, the Soviet bloc began to build a terrifying arsenal of nuclear weapons. America was determined to provide a deterrent to prevent the Soviet Union from ever using their bombs. This era of the Cold War now needed a strategy. We initiated and developed and planned and wrote the first nuclear war plan. It was a SAC war plan, but it became a national war plan. It was into this uncertain and highly charged environment that the B-52 came into service with the Strategic Air Command. Early B-52s had a six-man crew. On the upper flight deck with a pilot, co-pilot, and electronic warfare officer. On the lower deck with a radar navigator bombardier and navigator. In the rear of the aircraft was the tail gunner. Crammed throughout the wings and fuselage were the fuel tanks. And along the lower fuselage were the massive bomb bays. For some of these elite crews that SAC had selected, it was the first time they'd ever seen a B-52. When I walked around a B-52, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And then I look at the skin on this B-52, and it's all wrinkled, kind of like mine. And 